Can I see me? Uh, I can't. I can't see you yet. What I see, however, is Peter Popoff. Yeah. Uh, oh. uh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. I gotta move this stuff over. That Hold is on. Peter Popoff. Yeah, that is Peter Popoff. There's Mark Thorner. There's Josh Wheeler. Okay, now I gotta move this stuff over here. Uh, there we go. I gotta because I have to make the picture right Let's for see, everybody. I move this stuff uh, over. Oh, that and is then Peter I gotta, I gotta yeah, turn this off Peter the Popoff. audio. There's Mark audio. Thorner. Hold There's on Josh second. Wheeler. Hold on, I gotta do that. I got more things I have to do here. Uh, and somebody else was trying to call me uh, a moment ago, and I don't know who it was, so try calling again. Go call back. And uh, there, there we go. Now all the pictures and everything are just right for the TV, and we're ready to go. Boy, what if, what's wrong with you, Josh? What, what, li listen to him. No, I got a cough, I guess. I got allergies pretty bad. Really? Where'd you get them from? Just is it just uh, a lot of pollen in Susan, your area? It's not just pollen, Alex. It's 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 mold. She so she's got this whole thing about mold. Well, you think the pollen is the only allergen? It's not. Uh, it's it, just one of many. Yeah. Well, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I only have uh, or uh, I don't really know what causes them. I just I get them really bad, and I'm out yeah. of the regular pills, and the only pills I have. Or like the Benadryl pills, but I don't want to take any tonight because I had an accident at work and I got burned and I had to take a bunch of painkillers. And if I take that Benadryl with that, I'm going to be so drowsy I'll sleep for like three weeks. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 Benadryl. What's great about Benadryl is it's the best sleeping pill ever. Yeah. The worst thing about it is it it, it has a, a slap back the next day that Not is unbelievable. Me. I take it every night. And it does Benadryl? It, yeah. Nothing nothing affects her. <clears throat> well, I just, I didn't want to mix it with all that Percocet because it, you know, it's already makes you drowsy. And uh, I just, if I mix the two, I'm going to, I'm never going to wake up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I use uh, Xanax. I take a Xanax at night. So now I'm hooked on Xanax. Hello, Patrick. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I need, I have a bone to pick with Josh. Okay, well, before you pick a bone with Josh, <laughs> this isn't anything sexual, is it? Um, <laughs> well, it could be, depending. You know, uh, uh, let me just say to Mark, we can't see you, Mark, so start and stop your uh, your uh, camera, and we'll see you. There we go. Now it's whirling around, and you'll be with us any moment. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's bone picking time with Patrick. Boner? No, bone picking uh, time. <laughs> well, it could be the other two, but I don't know that, you know, yeah. we're on live stream if anybody would want to see that. So yeah. anyway, um, so last night I called Josh out on VE Day, and he washed out and didn't call in. I'm sure he had some fucking excuse like a baseball game <laughs> or something. So what the deal, man? Yeah, I missed it. So that's... So uh. It's a big anniversary uh, victory in Europe Day. It's uh, kind of a day that set the course for uh, really everything that's happened since then. Really, it all can be traced back to that day when the war ended in Europe. And uh, why? Why do you say it can all be traced back to that? Because it, from that point forward, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union and the United States were never were never able to implement some of the agreements they had made or failed to reach in some cases before the war's end, and uh, that point in history changed everything that's happened since. That's what led to the Cold War, uh, well, the division of Europe, um, you know, shortly after uh, the end of hostilities in Japan, that would follow in just a few months. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get things straightened around in Europe, mm -hmm. and that has really affected everything since. If you think about it, I mean, if there had been no Cold War, for example, if, if we had divided... Uh, if we hadn't divided Germany, if we had just occupied it in a nice, friendly manner where everyone got along, mm -hmm. uh, there would have been no Cold War. If there hadn't been a Cold War, we probably wouldn't have gotten involved in Korea. There wouldn't have been a, a domino theory to communism, so there probably wouldn't have been a Vietnam. You know, if there hadn't been a Vietnam, there wouldn't have been a huge uh, anti-war protest and counterculture rise in America. I mean, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, if but, you but, really but, want to but, sit down but, and do but, it, you but, can make a solid argument. Yeah, for but what you're doing is you're, if this happened, then this might have happened, and this might have happened. But you know something? Maybe it still all might have happened anyway. 
or or, 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 it, or it things very well, similar to it. It very well may have, but. I mean, didn't, didn't the Russians wait a minute, didn't, we have. didn't the Russians have a hard on for us to begin with because oh, yeah, we, because we, we never started that second front yeah. early enough? And a lot of Russians were killed. Yeah, twenty five well, million. million. That, <laughs> that's what, in the end, led to the division of Europe in the way that it did. So that's what I'm saying is, is if, well, if things we had, all, had turned out yeah. differently, things would have ter- would have followed differently. But it didn't, and I understand what you're saying. Uh, we're playing what if history, but the the point of it is, I guess, is what I'm saying is I am working off the of facts. I am able to answer your original question. I am able to trace back to that date, mm-hmm. and then we are able to follow events after that date. And I can just say this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And there may be some room for debate. But there is no doubt that all of those events are linked in a chain, mm-hmm. and that chain can go back to VED. Now, we can take that chain way – I mean, we can go back as far as we want. We started with VE Day because that was the topic of conversation that we started with, so we're starting from there. And that was a major turning point in the relationship with the Soviet Union and the United States because the war in Europe was over. And, you know, uh, we thought we were going to be on friendly footing You know, the Soviet Union had agreed to enter into the war with Japan. Matter of fact, they declared war on Japan conveniently Mm -hmm. uh, the day after we dropped the bomb in uh, Hiroshima. Hiroshima, Uh, yeah. So we were still friendly up to that point, yes. Uh, Which which one of our American presidents negotiated the end of uh, the European encounter? Was it uh, uh, um, uh, Truman or... uh, the uh, the liberal guy uh, with four terms. Um, FDR. FDR. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, FDR had negotiated uh, heavily with the Soviets for quite a long time, but it was Truman in the end, um, you know, who had the last conference uh, with Stalin, and uh, you know, really the the two sides they just they just misread each other and they didn't understand each other. I mean. I guess part part of the reason that history is so useful sometimes is because there are some things that have happened that can really be traced back to the fact that two cultures or two sets of people just didn't understand each other. I mean, to give you just a really quick example, you know, I was reading a book today about the Cuban Missile Crisis called One Minute to Midnight, and there was a little thing in there about how during one of his visits to the United States, uh, Khrushchev had been invited to come stay with President Eisenhower in 1960 at Camp David and he was so upset that the president had invited him to Camp David because he thought and all the Russians thought that this must be some secluded place where they were trying to to keep him away from everybody somewhere where they took people they didn't like so they couldn't go out and see things and what he didn't realize was that being invited to Camp David was actually an honor that it was you know he had been invited there to spend personal time with the president away from the distractions of the press of Washington so they could do real business. But at the time, they didn't see it yeah, that in way. Fact, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. many presidents use Camp David as the place to do business. Right. But because of the cultural disconnect between the Soviet Union and the United States... He didn't understand it. He didn't understand it. And he was yeah. very, very upset. And it wasn't until later on that, that they finally realized that they had made a mistake and they had misperceived it. But... The, the thing about that is, is how long goes before they realize their mistake where there's tension there? You see, there's oh. tension there that doesn't need to be there. And that's kind of the same thing that happened at the Potsdam conference with Truman and Stalin mm. and, and Churchill and everyone vying for power in Europe. Um, I mean, you know, there's a reason that there was a book written recently called Bloodlands, yeah. Europe between Hitler and Stalin. And it's because Stalin was just as tyrannical as Hitler. He probably killed just as many people. He oppressed, imprisoned, and to use a good word for it, exterminated just as many people as Josh, Adolf Hitler. Was Camp ways. David uh, was Camp David named after David Eisenhower? You know, I don't know the answer to that. And sure. and and if that's in fact mm-hmm. uh, if I'm in fact correct, which I think it is, mm-hmm. uh, then it wouldn't have been there at the uh, at, at the end of World War II. Because um, Eisenhower was a general, not a... Well, uh, this president. was in 1960 with Nikita Khrushchev. Oh. I wasn't referring oh. to Stalin. 
Um, oh, I was okay. just using that as an example for later, uh, just as an example of how sometimes when two cultures just don't understand each other um, and refuse to try, mm -hmm. um, I guess what I'm trying to make the bigger point that, you know, I think we, uh, we don't give diplomacy enough of a chance sometimes because we just have a cultural disconnect. And the problem it very well may be solved without conflict, but it leads to conflict because two different cultures, and this isn't just with the United States. This could be two other nations that we don't have anything to do with. They just don't, they just don't get each other, and they haven't taken the time to try and learn it. And I think that's what uh, history and historians um, can provide. You know, generals provide battle plans, and historians can try and provide context to help you understand mm. what mistakes have been made and why you should maybe sometimes before you go ahead with, you know, your other plans, maybe just give it one more go around, maybe just one more look. Did we miss anything here? Is there anything, you know, that we're, that we're missing that we can do differently to try and fix it? And those are the kind of things that didn't happen in 1945, you know, after the war in Europe ended mm -hmm. and, you know, you had, three superpowers, Britain, uh, the Soviet Union, and the United States, all vying for their own little piece of the pie. No one really took the time to sit down and think about, and this is something that Kennedy did a nice job of during the Cuban Missile Crisis, no one took the time to sit down and say, if I were Stalin, what would I be thinking about what we're doing? And Stalin certainly didn't sit down and think, well, if I were Truman, what would I be thinking? You know, they... Yeah. They fail to look at it from the other side of the table, and this is how we got, you know, into issues. And like I said, everything. Well, so, so where, but what, where, where do you where, where do you feel that disconnect between the Soviet Union? Because this is the crux of the whole thing. That mm -hmm. disconnect between the Soviet Union and the United States took place. Was it over the fact that we didn't start that second front? Was that really the bone of contention and the twenty five million? Russians who died and then us running around after the war saying we won the war when in fact I, you know, it, I, it, I it, a great deal of that was done by the Russians as well and they did it in blood and treasure I don't think that it was because of that I think why Stalin may have been uh, very upset about that uh, he was a he was a far more calculated man uh, politically I mean he may have been very vindictive mm -hmm. Uh, amongst his own people uh, in the fact that he would basically eliminate what he saw as opposition. But I think what drove up more than anything was not revenge, but it was just the fact that the two sides had a philosophical difference about what should dominate the world because of their, their upbringings and their past, whether it be a capitalistic society or a socialistic society. And they, they truly feared you know, their, uh, their nationalistic extermination at the hands of the United States by taking over Europe and forcing it all into a capitalistic state. They saw that as a real threat to them. You know, it would cut off their natural resources. It would cut off their, you know, economic uh, system. I mean, they just felt like they were going to get cut off at the knees. Uh, let me let, let the me US ask you a question though. At, at the beginning of the war, weren't the Russians kind of cooperative with Hitler? <laughs> Yeah, they were very cooperative. Yeah. They signed a uh, they signed a non-aggression pact. Was that the uh, with Hitler the, very early on? And I don't remember the name of the the document, whatever what, it was what, called. But was that the uh, thing that the prime minister of uh, of England brought back and said, "We have peace in our time" or whatever? And no, no, that was a separate that that was a separate issue. Um, you was, know, the the was the issue the, of appeasement. Yeah. Um, but. No, the the Russians had basically signed a, a non-aggression pact with with Germany that that basically said, you know, we won't get in your way if you don't bother us, if you don't threaten our nationalistic views, if you leave us alone, we won't get in your way. And um, for various reasons, uh, not too long after they signed it, Hitler decided not to honor that agreement. He attacked and provoked the Soviet Union. Um, which was a grave mistake, and the war was basically on after that. Um, you know, Hitler made many, many mistakes, and that was that was one of the worst. Uh, was drawing the Soviet Union into the war. Yeah. 
Um, it, it was basically the equivalent of, of the Japanese drawing the United States into the war. Mm -hmm. Really, from the time that happened, the war was over, okay? I mean, I understand it took five years for it to be over, but from the time they made those moves, the war was over. Uh, Patrick, from the minute the Japanese yeah. bombed Pearl Harbor, the war was over. Patrick. But it took time for it to happen. Patrick. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, it, it, with, the, uh, with the Nazis attacking uh, Russia... It's no different than Napoleon going in, uh, attacking <laughs> Russia in 1812. I mean, right. all Hitler needed to do was read up on history to see what time of the year to attack, and winter sure to hell ain't it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they got bogged down badly. He didn't it, learn from Napoleon, did he? No, and it, it really, to me, is that simple, because uh, Napoleon, I know there was a, a poem written, and it was... 1812, and I forget who wrote it, and the numbers were uh, 10,000, uh, he took 10,000 with, and he lost like 5,000, and there wasn't a shot fired. They, they just died from starvation, and, you know, I mean, you and, and the scorched earth, that whole thing with uh, Russia, I mean... The Nazis were a bunch of morons when it came to uh, tactical stuff with Russia. I mean, they may have uh, obviously overthrown Poland and and the European countries, but you know, you're going into Moscow. Uh, you know, you, if you're not prepared for the weather, yeah. you're gonna fucking lose. Yeah. Right, well, there was a difference between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and yeah. they failed yeah. to draw that line of demarcation and realize that there was a difference and and that you know that's that's what he's right that's what got him in the end i mean you know really the the point where i think it all turned you know and i'm not a world war ii you know scholar i mean somebody might disagree but i mean for the most part after stalingrad when when the germans were defeated at stalingrad and they basically the russians just basically just outlasted them um, uh, by, in many ways, eating their own. I mean, Russian people in Stalingrad during the siege, uh, I read a book earlier, uh, about a year ago, that, that described it as, you know, at first they ate the dogs, and then when there were no more dogs, they ate the cats, and then when there were no more cats, they ate the rats, and there were, when there were no more rats, some people ate their own kids who had died of starvation. I mean, they literally just outlasted with guts the German, the, the German soldiers, and Germany never thought that's what would happen. They thought that they would just give up. Wasn't they would just, and, and, you know, and I don't know if this is just you know propaganda on our part, but what wasn't there something about Stalin uh, literally forcing his people to fight in Stalingrad too? That if they didn't, oh, uh, they were going to get they would get he, shot. Absolutely, he armed civilians in Stalingrad and ordered them to shoot any deserting soldier from the line. In other words. If you see any soldier coming through town, he has come from the front line, he is a deserter, and he is to be shot dead. And then he left basically what you might want to consider uh, secret police or whatnot to watch the people who were supposed to shoot the mm -hmm. people, and they had the same orders. If you see someone who doesn't follow this, you shoot them dead. I mean, he literally, it was the, I believe it was the, you know, not one inch the decree right. you will not give one more inch to the german army or i will shoot everyone that i need to personally if i must yeah in order to see that that decree is fulfilled boy is this a depressing discussion uh yep. it, patrick it, it, i think it if 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 you look at it we i think it's something that we forget about all the time the significant uh, and not just for American history, but world history. There are things that happen that we, you know, we seem to ruminate on current events now, like the, what's going on in the Gulf and things like that. But you have victory in Europe Day. That was not only a victory for the United States. I mean, that, in, that ended the war in Europe. And like Josh said, a few months later, here we are, we're bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that's going to end the war in the Pacific. And these are things, I mean, you know, younger people can go back and say, wow, that's <clears throat> history, but 
you know, we forget about the Civil War as well and things that happened there, and we just fail to, to recognize them. And war is not something that's exciting and and happy, but I think it's shit that needs to be remembered. Right, and well... We need, to, we need to recall our history. The thing is, though, is from that point, from that day, from VE Day forward, within six months, basically, two things happened that changed the world forever that we still live under, Okay. The nuclear age was born, and capitalism versus communism in the Cold War was born. Mm -hmm. And we still live under those two clouds. We still live under a cloud where one nation could annihilate another if it ever wanted to. I don't ever think it'll come to that. But there are enough nuclear weapons on this planet to wipe us all out a billion times over if we ever chose to do it. And we still live under this cloud of, you know— What's right, a capitalistic society or a socialistic society? I think we found a way to deal with it without violence for the time being. But will there ever be another time where we can't settle that argument without violence? There probably will be because there always has been. There's been periods of rest and periods of unrest. We are fortunate enough, in my opinion, to live in a period of rest. Yes, but I do see, you know, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and uh, I don't know if anybody wants to agree, disagree with me. Hi, Mark. By the way, Mark's got something wrong with his leg today, is it? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's why he is in a prone position. It's not that he's lying here sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not putting him to sleep. Yet. No, you're not. In fact, I got a story to tell you guys. Oh, okay. Go ahead. 2008, I went to visit Potsdam when I was in Germany. Mm-hmm. And they have a nice restaurant there, had a good meal. Mm -hmm. Then we toured the castle. And right before the castle tour, yeah. where all the signing was, was done, mm -hmm. we were told, please, no picture taking. Now, considering the history mm -hmm. and what happened there, yeah. And the fact that we practically rebuilt Germany for them. Yeah. <laughs> and all this shit that happened. Uh, I, I was about to, you know, I, I damn right I took pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I put my camera on stealth mode and, and I'm thinking, good, start a fucking international incident with me, will you? I, I was furious. I mean, through that whole trip to Germany. I was very contemplative. I was very, you know, you know, had had that earth-shaking epiphany. Mm -hmm. But this, I was, I was like, "You're fucking kidding me! No picture taking, no." Tell them you were on assignment. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, if I, I, if anyone walked up to me, oh my god, I was like, I dare you. I, 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 I was King Kong. I was Robert Conrad waiting for someone to try to knock that battery off my shoulder. Uh, no one bothered me, you know? But you know something? It, it may sound strange, uh, but I, I've been a lot of places in this world. Uh, I travel most of Europe. Uh, I've been to China, which I'm uh, so glad to go to China. I've always I've wanted to go there, and it's, <clears throat> it's great we're living in a time when you can. But I really haven't spent that much time in Germany, and there's a good reason for that. It's the Jewish part of me that just doesn't want to be there. Yeah, well, there's a German Jewish part of me, Alex, that I had to go there for. And yeah. it was confronting a lot of personal stuff. And, you know... Um, I mean, all I remember about Germany, I was there once. And I was walking down the street, and somebody in back of me sneezed. And I said, Gesundheit, and I suddenly realized I was right. Yeah. And that that's was, right. That's right. That's about all I remember. That and I was in. Oh, I was. I remember this. I was in Nuremberg, where we were, we were staying. We were staying in a town called Herzogenarach, which is near <clears throat> Nuremberg. So we went to Nuremberg, and as you walked down the street, there were these stores, like you know, uh, uh, um, curiosity shops, mm -hmm. and in the windows would be like Nazi caps and Nazi armbands and stuff, but covered up. The, the swastika was covered up. You couldn't display the swastika, but you could sell the swastika. <clears throat> so with all that going for it, I, I couldn't get out of Germany fast enough. So capitalism won out after all. 
<laughs> yes, yes like, capitalism. Yeah, and, 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 and in a weird way, but I actually, <clears throat> with one other small problem, I actually had a good time, and I would like to go back and visit. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I wish Max were listening right now or online because I would love to hear his take on what we're saying about Germany because that's where he's living right now. I know, and he's living in Berlin, which is very important to me, too, because uh, for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it, it's, I'll tell you one thing I liked about Berlin. It, it had the same energy that a good part of New York had in the 80s. And I, I was like, why, why am I enjoying this? I should not be enjoying this. Then I put, hey, this feels like Greenwich Village in the 80s, and it was really cool, you know? Yeah. And then I realized that a couple of really good friends of mine moved to Germany in the 90s. Yeah. And they were pissed off. It's like, why didn't you call us? It's like, I didn't know you were there, you know? So, um, yeah. It was, it well, was you know when I would have liked to have been in Germany was, was before, what was it, before the war? The Weimar era, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We know they had all the clubs and the singing, and Bertolt Brecht was doing theater and all of that, you know. But my grandfather was a doctor in Berlin, yeah. That's what I would like to have visited, too. I think that's post-World War One. Yep. But pre-World War Two, and, yep. and just the culture and everything uh, of that time. Uh, it, what's very interesting, I've been a big fan of, as you know, of movies, and especially got into... Silent film. I saw, We. I actually walked around where the old UFA studios were. Right. That was important. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see that. I was hoping there'd be something. But they have a great film museum there now, uh, which... Well, they had, if you think about it, all the great directors in America in the 40s were directors from Germany. Who yeah. came here because either they were Jewish and wanted to get away or their political beliefs weren't compatible. You, and you had guys like Fritz Lang, for instance. Unfortunately, Fritz Lang never made a really great movie over here. He made great movies in Germany. You know, he made movies like Metropolis, uh, M, I believe, was Fritz Lang. Uh, pictures like that. When he came here, they were, you know, the studio system just didn't know how to deal with with that kind of mind, but, but what they did in Germany during the silent era and what they invented was a thing called the moving camera. Up until then, they'd just shoot, you know, and then they'd shoot another shot, and then they'd shoot another shot. But if you watch any of those German silent films, that camera is moving. They would put it on swings, and they would have it go back and forth, and I mean... They did just did some amazing film back then. But you know what was interesting, Alex? I'll, I'll just leave you with this little I mean, I'll bit give of you Nos Nosferatu, Metropolis. Uh, oh, that's just the uh, tip. There's so much know. that was lost. But because of the hyperinflation that was going on, I mean, literally, people were bringing wheelbarrows full of money yeah. just to buy a loaf of bread. Germany, Ufa, had to keep producing movies quickly in order to get as much money back in. Oh, listen, you want to hear the greatest uh, little piece of trivia about movies. End of, towards the end of the war, how bad was it, uh, 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 Josh, in Germany? I mean, these people were on their last, uh, their last legs, right? Uh, toward the end of the war? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. they had started to suffer quite a bit by the end of the war. What was Goebbels doing? He <laughs> was diverting something like 10,000 troops from the front lines dressing them in battle outfits and putting them in say. a movie called The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Which is they were making a movie and diverting troops from the war which they were losing in order to make that movie. Mm -hmm. And the writer of that movie was Jewish. He was, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. I have a copy of it. It's Sound and Kino Home Video. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing movie. In fact... You, you're da I damn the movie because of when it was made and under the conditions because it's an amazing movie. It deserves to be a classic. And it's as unique in its own way as what Terry Gilliam did years later. Well, I mean, it, the thing about that movie was that, that Goebbels did that film to instill in the German people a feeling of nationalism. 
because of this, this uh, the character and everything is such a heroic type of character, even though he's a fool. The message at the end was, I've had enough. <laughs> that was the message, you know? He didn't want to, you know, it was... I, th I thought it was the perfect anti... I was like, this is the perfect anti-war movie. Yeah. How did this get made? But I'll tell you, we got a lot of great directors because of that war. I think Billy Wilder came here for because of it. Uh, um, um, uh, what's, Zimmerman. Fred Zimmerman. Fred, uh, Fred Zimmerman, yeah. I mean, a lot of them. Just uh, and, and the person who figured out... This is the weirdest bit of, her, of trivia. Mm-hmm. The for the one director who actually taught Lucy and Desi how to shoot "I Love Lucy" with the three cameras, yeah. the lighting. He was from Ufa, also, so it was amazing. You know, they really invented, mo you know, a lot of the modern techniques. Oh no, the Germans were the leaders in making film. Alfred Hitchcock went to Germany to learn how to make movies, and came back. And if you look at Hitchcock's technique, it's very Germanic. In, in yeah. nature hey jim but, you've been very quiet over there yeah I've, oh, sorry yeah i've just been very quiet <laughs> <laughs> i i agree senator yes i have been very quiet uh, are you now or have you ever been a canadian <laughs> yes <laughs> and i will name other canadians if need be by the way, can you explain that story that uh, that that uh, uh, Rube told us last night? Because it was rather, in some ways, disjointed and didn't make sense. But maybe to an American, it may have made sense to a Canadian. No, uh, but I do know that uh, there have there have been times at the border that uh, uh, they have restricted people coming across the border with a, a DUI. And uh, I don't know what all I I'm, I'm not a expert on on border relations, but uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Nope, yet, nope, nobody I, nobody drives drunk in uh, in uh, uh, in Canada. Just zambonis. Oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> just zambonis. <laughs> and and yes, I do need my passport to come into the United States now. Oh, you do need it. Yes. Okay. And do we need one to get into Canada? I think we do now. I think yeah. you do. Yes. Yeah. Now. Why yeah, do we you, let you do. we let terrorists come into our country uh, through Canada and Mexico? Uh, you mean to say we can't get you know one American citizen up there with a DUI? <laughs> well, you and, just said it. You let. Oh yeah, we do. You let them in. Yeah. So we welcome them. We we give them uh, greeting baskets. You know <laughs> when they when they come over. Hey, you want to learn how to fly? Obviously, you know. <laughs> it sounds like it's some horrible, some horrible red tape snafu because if well, it's not a horrible red snake, uh, red tape snafu. What it is is a bunch of people wanting to come into this country to do no good. So they're they're going to be a little more careful of how they get into the country. No, you know? I meant Rube. Oh, Rube. Yeah. Oh, well, he's, he's been in previously. If he'd been in previously in the the TRP or whatever the thing it's called, yeah, I. Uh, I, I don't know. You know what a TRP is in the medicine? It's called what? a terp. It's when they shave your prostate. Huh? Yeah, they shave your prostate. They, it used to be they would remove the prostate <laughs> if, if you uh, had trouble peeing. Now they, they shave the prostate. <laughs> trim the fat. Yeah, trim the fat. <laughs> what, do you use a laser? And it's, call, it's with... called a terp. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Didn't need that part Something anyway. Forward to. They yeah. give you extra. They give you extra, exactly. <laughs> I got plenty. Yeah, uh, but hey, so, so you, Alex. Yeah, uh, I. You know, I was going to mention one thing about the Google <clears throat> Hangout. Uh, did you notice that I was on an iPhone and it and you had video? Yeah. And uh, where you where that doesn't happen on the uh, Skype. Well, no, and, Skype, Skype, you can do it on the iPhone if you're just calling another person. If you're on a, a group call, you will not get video. Well, I was on a group call. Yeah. Uh, on, and, and it worked. And uh, I have another friend that uh, does uh, some uh, broadcasts like this, and he uses Spreecast. So if you're looking for another service, I don't know if it's any better or worse, but a sp a Spreecast. Yeah, Spreecast, though, in, you're initiating the program to be broadcast. Right. Uh, where uh, There's a guy named Sam Lippert who wants to join us. Let's see here. Uh, Sam yeah, Lippert, are you there? <clears throat> yeah, hello. Hi, thanks for joining us. You're a, you're a newbie. You're a first-timer. I'm a first-timer. 
Hammer. I called a couple of weeks ago yeah. from my car, but oh. he goes. You you were having trouble. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, can can you see the video? No, I can't see or the video. Video? No. Okay. Uh, if you turn off your video and start it again, we might be able to. Uh, that sometimes kicks it in. Uh, but are you on an iPad? Uh, no, I'm on a on a Android tablet. Oh uh, well, that, maybe that's the reason why you can't. Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't allow for joint calls. They don't allow video on Skype for joint calls from tablets. So that. Oh wait a minute! All of a sudden, I think we lost him. Are you still there, Sam? We lost Sam. Uh, well, well, that's that's. Uh, well, at least we had a newbie. That was nice. Call back. Where are other people tonight? Where's uh, Where's uh, uh, Dan Meyer? We always hear from Dan. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see here. I'm Dan sure. blew his load early. He huh? was <laughs> what? <laughs> What'd you say? Dan blew his load early on on Albert. Oh, show, did he really? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know, uh, I wish people would blow their load on my show. You know, that would be nice. Um, but anyway, uh, you, so you were saying that uh, I, what I found was the sound on uh, Google uh, groups was not very good. Uh, uh, and and the only uh, Hangouts, rather, the only good thing about Google Hangouts is we could broadcast it on YouTube live. But then, you know, we become a video show again, and I don't really want to do that. I do that once a week. I'm doing it right now, and it cuts down on the amount of people listening to us. And then they're watching us, and it's, you know, it's... Uh, I thought YouTube didn't allow profanity. YouTube doesn't... Do, oh, no, you can use oh. profanity on YouTube. Uh, they don't like uh, nudity or sex. Right. Oh. Uh, which is why I don't like YouTube. And neither does Facebook. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've seen some nudity on Facebook. I've seen some, like, porno actresses. A uh, Twitter, Twitter, I've seen penetration on Twitter. Well, yeah, one of one of my uh, uh, photographer friends posted a uh, uh, something uh, the front cover of his book on uh, on Facebook, and he was banned for a month. Really? <laughs> yeah, they turned his account off for a month. Really? He couldn't post. Yeah. Why are they? Why are we this way? I mean, to begin with, in other countries, nobody would think twice about that. So it, it doesn't Facebook suddenly become, I mean, they're enough of a prude with us, but considering they're an international organization in England, aren't they just downright uh, 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 stuck up snobs? I don't know if they have different rules. Yeah. I think uh, it has all to do with advertising. They're trying to become more advertiser friendly. They want it all has to do with getting bucks out of companies. and. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wonder if it's not really more than that, though, because... I just don't understand why everyone's so sensitive about things that for some reason are perceived to be, you know, tabooish. I mean, and we don't even have to get into a conversation about this if you want, but I'm just an example of why I think it's deeper than that is, you know, I was listening to a lecture the other day uh, from a class somewhere. This wasn't a major university, okay? It's full of college kids, 22, 23 years old, mm -hmm. and they're they're getting a lecture from their professor and the topic was the civil war and during the lecture every time he would read a quote or uh, a description from a primary source that contained the word nigger he would say n-word and he would read it as n-word this n-word that and i'm thinking you're trying to train a group of historians and you're reading from a primary document and you can't use the word i mean give me a break you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, well, here's, here's what why I, is that? But here's what I don't get. I, I love it when, for instance, on the radio they go, and we can't say the F word. Right. Well, you can't say the F word, but what you just did was make everybody think of the word fuck. <laughs> so what's the difference between saying it and making people hear it in their the minds? FCC. Huh? The FCC and Which, funds. by the way, if you, were to pronounce, if you were to pronounce FCC, how is it pronounced? <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the point is, I mean, I, I've never been able to figure that out about like the N-word. Oh, we're going to be nice. We're going to say, you, you know, he said the N-word. Well, you just said it, too, in your own way. Yeah. yeah. And But but like and my biggest thing was this was in a setting where you would think that it would be needed 
Don't you think that these people who are being trained as historians should hear the word that they should have a full understanding that during that period of American history, yeah. people use that word in a derogatory manner. Yeah. You need to understand. I mean, why are you brushing it off as in word? I mean, he came across about six or seven instances well, maybe during if we, about you, we, an hour lecture where instead of saying the word nigger, he said N word. And I, I just don't understand. I mean, each well, professor well, to his own, I guess. But if it's me, I'm using the quote the way that it was written during well, let me source. put it this way. Every racist I've ever known, okay, has always said, well, why can't we use the word? Because they use it among themselves. Well, to begin with, it's among themselves. And what they're doing is they're disempowering the word. In other words, uh, Lenny Bruce used to have a bit he used to do about it in which he used the word nigger repeatedly. He said, he said nigger, 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 nigger. And he said it over and over and over again about 20 times. And then he said, it doesn't sound so bad now, does it? You know, uh, the, the right. fact is that, that using the word disempowers the word. But I think that by saying N-word, we empower the word, you know, and, and uh, uh, but uh, oh, we've got to be correct and, and say the N-word. But that empowers the word. Patrick. Um, it just, it, Josh makes a good point because it reminds me of all the, the idiotic parents and teachers and all of the overly hypersensitive people with Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. I mean, we don't want to say nigger Jim in the book, so we're going to eliminate it, you know, in some versions. I mean, come on. It was written at a time in history when it was used. And to, to me, to remove it, mm -hmm. it, to remove a part of history... And we, we start to forget what things were like. And, you know, it's it just, it's idiocy. And, you know, at, it, to me, um, if, if a kid was learning or reading that book, that would be a teaching moment as a parent to say, look, it's a bad word. We don't use that in society now. But it was a term that was used. And, you know, you, you have a discussion about it. Just like in the classroom. Now, when I was in school and we read Huck Finn, we had that short discussion that, look, you're going to read this word. You know, it's not a, it's not a term that we use. It, it's a bad word, but it was part of history. Mm -hmm. This is what black people were called as just the same as we call them black people now or African Americans. And even the term African American wasn't used when I was in high school. You do you know there was so, a time when I was growing up, the, the term that we used was Negro. We were always taught you don't call them. I'm going to say well, it, colored. nigger. You call them, or or, or 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 well, some people would call them colored, and that was still kind of passable because it wasn't the bad word. Okay, but but the term that was commonly used was Negro. I mean, come on, you've got the National Negro College Fund. Um, right. uh, you've got the National Association for the Advancement of Colored, Colored People. people. Right. All right. So uh, all these names were created at a time of this uh, this other sensitivity. Um, but the one thing that at that time black people I know didn't like to be called was in any way anything associated with African. Uh, you know, I mean, you didn't go up to a to a to a, to a Negro and say, oh, you're an African-American, he'd probably tell you to you, shut the fuck up, you know? Yeah, well, and all of a sudden, say he was an American. Huh? Yeah, I, that's... Say he's an American. Yeah. I've never yeah. understood uh, why... I, I wish that we had uh, someone who could call and help with this uh, uh, that was black. I've never understood... Charlie, why, where are you, Charlie? Yeah, why they were uh, wanted to be endeared with the term African-American. I mean, to me... It's wrong because they're Americans. They're American. I mean, I don't call myself, I want to be referred to as Anglo-American. No, I'm American. I, I mean, refer to myself as Italian-American, and I, I, I identify with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I suppose, I just do. I suppose yeah. when someone's asking you about your heritage, but that's, but that's but, uh, but, different but, but, than but, I, I think wanting your, your race to be referred to that way. Uh, and I guess what I'm saying is, is, when you check off the box of what your race is, um, 
ours doesn't say, you know, theirs might say African American. Ours just says Caucasian for the color Correct. of our skin. It doesn't right. say Anglo American. <laughs> you right. know, I just, I, I, I've always just found that confusing. I mean, we can go along and get along with whatever they prefer, but <laughs> but African American is perfectly acceptable. I find that oh, outside oh. of the the big cities, like I grew up on Long Island. 15 miles from Manhattan mm -hmm. and then I, I as I got older and I met people from other parts of the country and the one I'm thinking about specifically is Texas and it was something growing up you'd always say so what are you oh I'm Irish or I'm German I'm Italian I'm Jewish I'm this I'm that when I started asking people who were not in the New York metro area what are you they'd look at <clears> you I'm American and right. I'd say well no what we're you know what's your lineage what's your heritage I don't know and I always found that shocking yeah. yeah. Uh, Patrick. Well, I was going to just say that, you know, the, the term African-American is an interesting term used because we assume that everybody nowadays who is black prefers that. But in fact, if you go to Europe, if you go to Great Britain, they're not called, to my understanding, um, British African or African British, they're they're British, and um, you know, an American yeah. who are black and are from, let's say, Jamaica. I never hear anybody calling themselves Jamaican American. <laughs> you know, it and and we because they're always stoned. And we assume <laughs> <laughs> we assume they want to be called African American, but. I think that's a big assumption on our part. I'm going to tell you something very interesting. I don't know how many of you watch a lot of British television. I do because I think it's the best television created anywhere. And what I love about the Brits is that they will have a black person on a show. He's not playing a black person. I saw, I, I, I saw one thing about uh, the, uh, the French Revolution, and one of the maids in the court was black. Because she was one of the lead characters and was played by a black actress, they don't cast based on race. They don't. They don't say like we do in America. Well, this character <clears throat> should be black, and this character should be white. Uh, if you ever watch like Doctor Who, you'll see people just they're they're just playing anybody, uh, and they're not you know they're not playing black. Well, but it, so it but it it can be maybe traced back to that. Sensitization where, 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 who, that we were referring to earlier. Where's that noise is, coming from? I'm not sure. There looks like Sam. Sam, is that you, Sam? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, he's back. I didn't notice you were back, Sam. Excuse me. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, if you're no rat problem. if you're rattling something, don't rattle something. And if you want to join in, just chime in because I can't see you. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get the video to work. So well, I, I don't think you're probably gonna, I, what the rattling was. No, I think what your problem is is that you're using, you're trying to get video on a group call uh, uh, from a pad, and they don't allow that on Skype. Okay, if you were on a desktop machine, okay. you, would, you wouldn't have any problem at all. But don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just chime in when you have something you want to say. But anyway, as I was, I can do that. huh? I said I can do that. Okay, good. Uh, the point is, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say to you uh, all is, is that in England there doesn't seem to be a, this idea that because somebody is, I mean, there's a show called Luther, uh, and I think you may have seen it. it, it they've shown it here in America uh, with, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the actor now. Boy, my mind's in bad shape tonight. Um, and he's black. But the character is not played as black. Yeah, Idris Elba. Idris Elba. Yeah. He just played as Idris, you know. It, it, you know, I mean, occasionally they'll do something where, like they did a thing called Dancing on the Edge, and they had the guy who was in 12 Years a Slave in that. And yes, he was playing a black band leader from the 1930s, but the reason <laughs> for him being made to be black was to show the prejudice that existed at the time. But they, they, they'll have people playing parts, and you go, gee, you know, they're, they're having somebody in the, the royal English court who's, a, who's black, and it, they're just there. Yeah. And it is not that, oh, now we can see you. Yeah, I switched to the laptop. Hello, Sam. How are you? Good to see you. Where are you calling from? Cincinnati. Okay. Cincinnati. If, anytime you want to say something, do what uh, 
Uh, Patrick's doing right now. Wave your wave your hand, Patrick. Cincinnati. Yeah, I, I've got a uh, question for our Canadian friend. Yeah. Um, what do African Americans call themselves in Canada, or what do you refer to them as? Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's it. I've never heard the word or the word or the term African Canadian. Yeah, well, you made my point then, and I right, I, that was I, my point too. Well, now I got well, a, a question, and really, I wish we would get somebody who's black to call this program right now. Just Great American Broadcast, Skype us. I'd like to get your opinion on this. In America, we have such a thing that's been was once uh, called, uh, for lack of a better term, ebonics. Okay, right. uh, uh, there is a patois that uh, some black people use. I hear it all the time here in Harlem. Uh, and by the way, it contains the N word very prevalently. Okay. Yet when you go to a place like Canada, you go to a place like England, England blows your mind when you hear a black person with a British accent talking like this, you know, um, do you, is there, is there a black accent in Canada or uh, is it like it is in England where it is just the accent of the, uh, of the realm? Where it's he, just, where, it's just the accent of, of, I, I mean, obviously there's people who, who emigrate here and they bring their oh, accent, yeah, but there is yeah. not a, a particular... But a yeah, uh, born and bred black Canadian, if I were to be talking to them on a, on a radio program or on the phone, would I be able to necessarily tell they were black like I no. could with an American black? No, because they could sound like me or they could sound... they could they could If they were brought up in Montreal, they could have a French accent or they could be from uh, Newfoundland or PEI and... And and sound like the squid jiggers they are. I said jiggers, <coughs> by the way. A Alex? Is that a... Uh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, let me see here. Uh, yes, uh, Phil. Yeah. You know, it. Um, I think that the accent that's put on uh, sort of the ghetto accent or the uh, gangster accent amongst uh, black people uh, is, is a learned, put on... Uh, accent. I disagree. If you with speak you. to a black person that's educated, that uh, is not uh, uh, wish to uh, sound like a gangster, they don't. And you really uh, oftentimes cannot tell what race they are. Well, if you... I disagree with you to this extent, Phil. I live in Harlem. And so uh, I'm still living in, in a part of town that is still very heavily black and, and very inculcated mm -hmm. with black culture. And uh, the accents of the people on the street are very, I hate to use the word ebonic because I think that was thought up by a white guy, but we know what we're, what we're talking about. Uh, and, and so I don't think it's necessarily something that is affected. I think it is something that is, is spoken and has never, you know, the, those, those people who become doctors and lawyers probably spend a lot of time around white people, you know? <laughs> And, and and if they did have an accent, lost it a long time ago. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the accent. I'm just saying that it seems as though it's very predominant here in the United States. You hear a black basketball player, and he sounds he has this black sound to his, his accent. Whereas you go to uh, England, and you talk to a black person, and there's no can't black... Tell. You can't tell. That's well, I I'm think, saying. though, that uh, the Ebonics, it, it certainly at least creeps into... The white culture as well, because I can tell you I'm from a virtually an all white area. And uh, when I grew up in middle school and high school playing basketball, et cetera, my friends and I, I can tell you that uh, we spoke Ebonics fluently. <laughs> it's really? Not the best way I, I can speak. Uh, it. I speak Jubonics. <laughs> Jubonics. Well, you know something that we 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 do have that. I mean, uh, there is such a thing <clears throat> as Jubonics. Uh, we're being joined by Bud Fleischer. Hello, Bud. How are you this evening? Hey, Alex, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I don't have video on my phone here. Oh, well, that's okay. And I, have no I and I have no idea what's going on on your show, but I got the uh, the uh, the notice, you know, that, that Gabnet was on, so I figured I'd check in. Oh, yeah, that was from the uh, from the uh, the video 
thing that we run. Yeah. 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 Well, so, listen for a little bit and then chime in if you want to. Okay. Oh, absolutely, my yeah. friend. I appreciate it. Uh, let's ask Sam Lippert. Uh, uh, you've been listening to what we've been saying. I mean, there there are a lot of accents. I mean, in this country, especially there are Jewish accents, for instance, which if you go out to certain parts of New York City, uh, you're going to hear those kind of accents. I mean, uh, uh, but uh, well, Sam, well, I I think it I think it all has to do with the people that you're surrounded by when you're developing, or you know, and your your language is influenced by that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think a, a white person who grew up in a black neighborhood um, is gonna is gonna you you would listen to them and think, oh well, that's a black person. Because I, you know, I've worked with people like that, and I, I know people who, you know, that's the neighborhood they grew up in. Those are the people they spoke with, and you know, they develop that accent. You know, and when someone from from uh, a Yankee goes down south yeah. and stays there for a while, they develop a bit of a southern accent. So I think it's all influenced by what you hear every day. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're right uh, to a certain extent. It's very funny, but um, I lived in Houston, Texas for, what was it, it was two years, three years, something like that. And uh, my wife and I lived there, and um, uh, we had friends, and we talked with friends all the time and so on and so forth. And then I moved to New York, and I talked to one of my friends in Texas and suddenly noticed for the first time yeah that he had a Texas accent. But when I was surrounded by that accent, I didn't notice an accent. And so uh, what made it even more interesting was my wife acquired a Texas drawl, to, which to this day, I don't think she's completely lost. Yeah, but for how many of those years were you faking a British accent? Well, I, I did that. <laughs> I, it was part of my job. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which might have prevented me from having a, a real Texas sound in my voice. But what's amazing was that when I started talking to these people back in Texas uh, a year later, I went, my God, they, they, have, a, they have an accent. You know, and I couldn't, I couldn't figure that one out at all, where that comes uh, from. Alex, yeah. in, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, there's a large gay population and not all gays sound affected. Yeah, but if you walk around the streets, there's a, there's a lot of uh, people that I hear speaking in a very effeminate tone and uh, putting on a certain air that I'm sure they weren't born with. Uh, as you, far you know, as you know what I think that is. Speech patterns. To be honest with you, I think it's advertising. Yeah, it's to say to somebody else, "I'm gay." So you, I'm a, <laughs> if you're gay, I'm approachable. And the abonics is not uh, maybe that advertising well, you as don't, well? you don't have to advertise when you're black. It pretty well follows you wherever you go. You don't have to open your mouth. Uh, you get, but you get what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I exactly. mean, there were gays who used to wear keys on one side or the other, depending on whether they were tops or bottoms. And uh, I said the one reason I never became gay is I have a bad memory and I could never remember where you would put the keys <laughs> and I would be getting, you know... But the, uh, there is this problem. Uh, uh, I, I, let me give you another example of what, we, what I talk about when I'm talking about accents that we acquire. There's a thing I call cop speak. You know what I'm talking about? I was one for 20 years. If you, talk, I, if you talk, hear a bunch of cops talking to each other, they've got a certain something to their accent that is similar. Am I? Uh, you no, tell me I'm wrong. No, I, 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 I was uh, a reserve, which is a volunteer cop with an agency for 20 years mm -hmm. in the Bay Area, high crime agency. Yeah. And uh, there were uh, there were blacks, there were whites, uh, uh, cops, and uh, yeah, there's sort of a uh, a speak with abbreviations and so <laughs> forth. But as far as a specific accent. Uh, not really. There's. Um, I seem to have always heard one, or at least I. Maybe I, it's a cadence. It's a cadence. Yeah, that's even better, uh, Rob. I think a cadence is the best way to uh, describe. Yeah, when it. you combine it with the when you combine it with the lingo, it probably separates itself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was a 459 IFO, uh, you know, 23rd Street. <laughs> yeah. And uh, So now when we talk about Canada, Jim, are the ac the accents are basically just regional, right? They're not uh, they're not necessarily uh, um, uh, uh, ethnic. Yeah, because I mean, Canada prides itself in being a a multicultural society. I mean, that's the big deal. We should so, we should pride ourselves in that too, because we certainly are. Yeah. Well, I but mean, we, it's a but, big. But it's, we don't do a good job of it. So there are a lot of different accents from different people, uh, South Asians, uh, uh, Asian people, all sorts of people. Yeah. And yes, the accents have changed as, as immigration uh, has, has sort of spread out more yeah. to various parts of, of Canada. But again, the major differences you would find in any accents would just basically be... Uh, across the provinces and uh, those locations. Yeah. Like, so I have a question for you, Jim. I, oh. I uh, used to work um, with a guy who did a lot of traveling. I worked in television uh, and did a lot of sports and did a lot of hockey. And I met a producer who was the Philadelphia Flyers producer. We worked together for a bunch of years. And he was always in Canada, obviously. And he told me that, and, and I'm going to need help with this, but I, I can't remember if it was Montreal yeah or whatever city, I believe it was Montreal or Quebec, where there is a, a very strong prejudice by people against the French Canadians versus the, 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 the... Am I right about that? There's a really strong prejudice with those people? Uh, I don't know if it's really strong. It depends on, on again, what part of... I would think maybe more people in Ontario, uh, which borders Quebec, are there, there's a bit more ang angst between the two provinces. They're 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 both big provinces. They both pr bring a lot of money to Canada. They both have a lot of prestige. They're they're both very old provinces. Whereas British Columbia, is, where I am here in the West, it's a it's a it's a newer it, it, in terms of things it's, it's a it's like the western territories it's not as old as everything back east just like in the states so there is a bit of animosity there and uh, again like i said here in, in well, British I, Columbia, I, I could I'm a say western I, province I, just like alberta yeah. but i tend to be a little more annoyed with the albertans well i could so, say i could say after all they are fucking french <laughs> Do you think it's possibly that they want to speak French as the number one language and not English and vice versa? Well, they do speak it. Well, they, I, yeah, they, but the rest of the country doesn't. Well, no, the, the rest of the country is, is totally bilingual. All, all packaging is bilingual. I go to the grocery store. My, my, uh, my Rice Krispies are in French and English. Uh, the, it's, it's, Has this taught you how to read French? I knew French when I was younger, but then again, I moved with my family to the States, and then I became very fluent in Spanish. Yeah. Living in Los Angeles. And then I came back to Canada again, and I was speaking Spanish and English, and then I lost the Spanish, and I never really picked up the French again. Wow. But my, but my, my wife's a teacher, and she speaks French. But how do you get along in Canada and not use the word a boot? Because that's more of an eastern. Oh, really? It's more of a middle of the country eastern affectation. Yeah, and it's like y'all in the south, as opposed yeah, to us yeah. in the north. Don't say y'all. By the way, I, I got to tell you something. I mean, Canada may not have everything to offer, but it does have Rob Ford, and I, <laughs> I, I, I think that's uh, that's something worth he breaking down, up here. I, thought. I, no, I have a question. No. He's at, he's at rehab. No, he went to rehab, but never showed up. Oh. No, what happened was it was like room. <laughs> no, no, listen, this is true. He went and got on. An, he went and got on. A, his family have a company, mm -hmm. uh, and they have a business, and they have. Uh, and part of the business is in Chicago as well as Ontario. Mm -hmm. So 
they got on the uh, they got on this jet and he went to Chicago because he was going to go to a rehab facility in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been some discussion where he was not allowed to come into the United States. And, and the term <laughs> that is used in is that he was, he was allowed to rescind his application to the United States, which means they weren't going to let him in, and he has to sign a paper that says, "Yes, I am. I am saying I do not wish to go into the United States." It's very. Was this nice. a tit? Is was this a tit for tat? And is that why Ruben couldn't go into Canada? I have no idea. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. he came back to Ontario. Yeah, but Canada and... wants their tat back. <laughs> so he came back to Ontario, and now he is. Uh, he was. He is supposedly in this rehab facility, but. The other day, he he phones a Toronto Star journalist and starts talking to him, and the and so the journalist is interviewing him, and everybody's making a big deal about it because, first off, why is he 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 shouldn't have his cell phone in in the rehab. He 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 shouldn't be making contact with anybody outside the rehab. And then there's a Tim Hortons donut store. You and your damn Tim Hortons. Listen, he was seen. He was seen in his in his sweatpants and a sweatshirt buying donuts at this <laughs> Tim Hortons in in Toronto, and everybody was tweeting about it because he's very recognizable. And so this whole thing was going on. And then his brother, who is a counselor, basically like an alderman, in in the uh, Toronto city government and his biggest enabler next to his wife, I guess. But his brother says, Oh no, it wasn't, it wasn't Bob. It was me. I was buying donuts. And Oh, it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, with all this, with all this donut talk, you think he was a cop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, hey, I have a question, Alex is Bud in Florida. Yeah, have you yeah, uh, been, have you been to uh, Montreal? Have all. I been to Montreal? Yes, I have been to Montreal, but uh, I, I, under very uh, strained uh, circumstances to which I can't really remember much of it. And the reason uh, was is that I was going to the uh, Montreal uh, uh, Comedy Festival, mm -hmm. and uh, which I'm sure uh, <clears throat> Jim knows about, and um, very famous comedy festival. And we're going to go do our radio shows from there. And about three days before I was supposed to leave, I pinched a nerve in my back. I'd never done that in my life, but I somehow just reached for something and all of a sudden got this searing pain in my back. So now I go off to a doctor and he sends me to a therapist and the therapist starts working on it, but it ain't. it's going to take more than three days for this thing to get better. So he says, here, let me load you up with some Vicodin. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I start down on the Vicodin, mm. and now I'm in Montreal. I have people to this. One day I was talking to Jake Johansson in an interview, and I said, uh, by the way, uh, when I was in Montreal, I said, have you ever been to Montreal? He says, of course I was. I was there with you. Oh, gee. <laughs> you know, I couldn't remember anything. Well that's that's a really nice city it's it's very close to new york i think you're oh i don't know 300 plus 300 some odd miles from there yeah. and if you want to see a true um you know bilingual cultured metropolis with a, a lot of history that is a great town i highly recommend it for you and uh the missus uh yeah. now that the weather's getting nice uh i really think it's a place you would uh you know what really, i really what like. i would rather do is is go to uh revelstoke british columbia and bunk with uh jim i know well, the, you, the prospect you, probably you, scares you jim but... No, but that's okay because my lovely wife and i were discussing the fact about Possibly making a a trip when school was out to Harlem. Oh well, come down. You, I got a room right here. You can you can bunk there. But hurry up. We never know how long we're going to be here. So you know. have, have you spoken, Alex? Has, huh? Have you spoken about the apartment situation? Because uh, I can't listen as regularly, and and you were just starting to have some stress about yeah, it. Yeah, I or can't. You... I you know I've hesitated to talk about it because. Yeah. It is such an ongoing thing and has gotten so convoluted. I don't think, you know, knock on wood, I don't think we're going to be out of here anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at the present time, uh, we're not paying any rent 
because there's right. some question about that. There, there are a whole bunch of things. It's well, it, it. I think that we will prevail, but I, I can't really talk about all the nuances of what's going on. Yeah, I, you know, I once, um, you know, before I left New York, which was uh, '97, yeah. I had actually sublet uh, my apartment up mm-hmm. there, and I had what they call a sweetheart lease. My, uh, my mother managed. Um, apartment buildings forever and I got into a a $300 a month two bedroom apartment in Queens I mean Mm -hmm. that was like a frozen rent right Uh, um, and then what I did I didn't know if I was going to come back to New York and I sublet and what ultimately happened with me was uh, the guy that I sublet to got the lease and he had to pay whatever I mean I'm not you know spilling any beans for you but he had to pay what the rent would it have been had he legitimately gotten it after me even with the rent stabilization thing yeah. so i don't know what your situation is you may end up getting that lease and, and maybe even at a reduced rate for well there there paying. there are some questions about the legitimacy of even uh <laughs> oh my I, I don't i really can't get into yeah, it don't, but, don't, but, don't. but but i'm just sharing the, you know, the, my, it, yeah. let me put it this way if it comes out good we will get the lease to this apartment if it comes out bad i'm coming up to revelstoke and bunking with jim <laughs> okay you know okay. uh hey, hey back, back. and and and, uh, and i i think i can afford to eat a tim hortons there you go. <laughs> hey, hey back, back to accents. I, I just have a question for, you know, any of you guys out there. I yeah. mean, I'm originally from New York. I spent the first 36 years of my life. And I like to think that my accent is virtually gone at this point. But do you ever find when you go back around to be around people that you're from, your accent comes back. Uh, my wife looks at me sometime when I sit down with a group of New Yorkers mm-hmm. and the D's and the Do's and all that kind of, it's crazy, you know? Yeah, well, I, 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 I picked up his accent right away that he was in New York. I, I could pick up your accent. Too. Oh, okay, it's still there. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, where are you living now in Florida, did you say? I, I, I live in Boca Raton. <laughs> yeah. Nah, oh, that's New York oh. South. You live in, this you, is true. You live in, rat, rat, you live in Rat's Mouth. Yeah. It's yeah, it's great. I, I know you don't like Florida, Alex. Well, I don't but... like Florida, but I, I did have an ex-girlfriend who lives in, uh, in to this day in Boca Raton. So Yeah, I yeah. know that. I'm a fan, you know? Yeah, but, but you know, the thing is that it's it's Miami I hate. You see, I'm waiting. Yeah. I, I hope that, uh, you know, um, uh, Eric Tyson is, is right. Uh, on all his science shows when he says if we keep going at the rate we're going with uh, with global warming that Miami will be underwater within a half a century I can hardly wait for that you know you, the, you pl- fa- the you're fast- planning to see the, that on your 125th the birthday the faster that town can drown the better <laughs> now, now on the other hand uh, Mark Thorner is in uh, Naples so I don't think you'd yeah, are you in, would you be in danger <clears throat> oh hell yeah <laughs> Well, you can come. You can come stay here, okay? Oh, but uh, hey, Alex, if that happens, I'm going to the mountains. Well, you know, okay. I had a, I had a problem. My problem with uh, Miami was is I moved down there in what was the year? I'm trying to remember. I think it was ninety seven. Was ninety seven? No, it wasn't ninety seven. It was eighty eighty nine. Oh. Eighty nine, and that was just when uh, it it was the meanest city in America, and I think part of the reason was that was about the time they were all coming down off the cocaine they'd been living on for the past ten years, and 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 I I just thought it was the nastiest city I've ever been in in my life. Look, Rob has pussy. <laughs> now, what is the name of that cat? Maxie. Maxie. Yeah. Hi, Maxie. Is that the only cat you have? Yeah, just her. And now, am I right or wrong? Or is that a Burmese? No, that's a rag doll. That's a rag. Oh, it's a rag doll. Okay. Yeah. But they've got uh, some of the markings, some of the Siamese markings. Alex, I think they're, I think they're part. Uh, you know, they they were breeded originally yeah. with the Siamese. Yeah, I I love Siamese cats. I, mean, I I remember you had the most amazing cat. It was called Mouse, but yeah. and I think it was blind, yeah. but it could use your toilet. Uh, the only thing it didn't do was flush. Yeah, no, she peed in the toilet. She did the one day. I, I've told this story before on the air about how I started hearing somebody peeing in my toilet in the middle of the night and couldn't figure out who it was. And when I run in there, there was nobody. And I, this happened a couple of nights in a row. And finally, I saw her there sitting there on this toilet taking a pee. And my wife had told me that what happened was she had, uh, uh, the, she had noticed that the cat was constantly watching her when she'd go to pee. 
-hmm. and had, had learned how to do this. But she yeah. went blind uh, slightly before we came to <clears throat> California, and yet it, she was able to function beautifully, you know? You she, want to hear my, when Maxie was a kitten, I think I had her a, not even a week. Was that when she, when you didn't feed her as much food as it looks like you fed her? No, she's actually the perfect weight. She's about uh, 15 pounds, but really? they get big and she's not fat. She's just fur. She's a big fur ball. Yeah. So I had her less than a week and she, you know, she's like a dog. She follows you all over the place. And I was living in this apartment and she followed me into the bathroom and I was, you know, miss maybe TMI. I'm sitting there doing my business. I get up. Yeah. And before I get a chance to get up, she takes a dive to go into the toilet. <laughs> she thinks, OK, this is where I'm going to go. But I grabbed her by her back paws just before she landed in the water. And I was like, because with all that fur, it would have been a mess. Yeah. But <laughs> she just just, you know, I was like, oh, my God. And I grabbed her real quick. And I think she was thinking this is where the family does this. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jim just put up his uh, I'll be right back picture. It's not. Uh, is it on everybody's screen now? Big? Uh, no. Jim? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. Okay. It's just in Jim's place. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, cats, uh, you know, uh, I had one cat who was very curious about water and would jump into a swimming pool now and then just to wow. see what it was like. You know, uh, but cats are very natural swimmers, believe it or not. They have webbed <laughs> claws. If you look closely. Mm. Uh, they can. They, they were meant to swim. It's just they don't like to, because. Well, here's what happened. I had this cat, uh, Shabbos, and Shabbos was the most uh, Siamese and one of the most talkative Siamese I've ever known. You could hold a conversation with him. You know, mm. how are you? Meh. Mm. You know, I, I said he was doing his Edward G. Robinson impression. Meh. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, and um, one night he just wouldn't shut up. And I just went, I, I want to go to sleep. And this cat is just, he, he's just chattering up a storm. So I figured, I know what I'll do. He likes <clears> water. <throat> what I'll do is I'll f fill the tub up a little bit with water, dunk him in it. Then he'll have to spend the rest of the night cleaning himself. Right? Mm -hmm. So I dunk him in the water and he's dripping wet and not minding it because he, he didn't mind the water that much. And for the rest of the night, I'm trying to go to sleep with a cat going, nah, nah, nah. He's like cleaning himself. <laughs> yeah, so, we, we have we have s several cats. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to tell you how many we have. How many do you have? Because I bet uh, you don't have I'm, more I'm, than I'm I have. I'm seriously going to refuse to tell you because people typically don't believe it. But we've made a basically a life out of saving the lives of many, many cats. And, oh, you're one uh, of those people. Uh, it's not unsanitary we're not cat hoarders don't okay so yeah but i mean you can see a picture of my home there's not cats everywhere but but to what he was saying I, we had I, the two things is i have one that is particularly attached to me for some reason it's like rob was saying it's like a dog and we had this cat when it was so small we had to bottle feed it we've saved a lot of cats that were that young mm -hmm. and ever since that time i mean It'll be outside the door of this office when I lay down. He gets in the bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it never separates itself. And uh, we also have a cat that is obsessed, literally obsessed with drinking from the sink. It has to have fresh water. I guarantee you when this show's over, that cat is outside this door and will not leave me alone until I go downstairs. I turn on the kitchen sink and I let her drink from the water for a while. I mean, she's just obsessed with it. Wow. By the way, we, lost, you, we lost Bud Fleischer. I just if I sleep know. past 7 o'clock in the morning, she will come to the bedroom, and she will sit on the end of the bed. And if I even open my eyes and make eye contact where she thinks I'm awake, she will not let it rest until someone turns a sink on for her somewhere. Wow. Yeah, well, this, this cat that was blind used to, I'd be sleeping in the morning, and all of a sudden I'd feel a tongue on my eyelids. <laughs> <laughs> and I wait. I open my eyes, and there's this cat staring at me. You know, um, I I love cats. They're I do favorite. too. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a cat person all the way. I uh, grew up around dogs, and uh, uh, she's the first cat I've ever owned. And I I I would never go back the other way. As much I still love dogs, but cats are just so much cooler. They real, in my opinion. Anyway, they, they, they just, I, cats are cool. I've often said that about cats. When people, people who love dogs go, you got a cute face. But dogs, yeah. I always felt they're so submissive to people, you know? 
where cats are kind of, they're very <laughs> independent, you know? It's like they're your friend uh, as long as they're hungry, you know? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Sam. I was reading um, some research, or an article about some research a couple of months ago, and <laughs> they say that cats... Um, mm -hmm put up with us because they think we're just big cats. Mm -hmm. I and read that. And that's because part of that, and the reason dogs are different, is that we've spent you know thousands of years breeding the dogs we want, and cats generally pick who they're going to mate. Who they're going to mate? Yeah, with. yeah. And and so the cats are still just borderline domesticated. Well, right. cats were never raised uh, as uh, as helpers. Dogs were helpers. They they were part of hunting. Uh, they were you know they, they can be used for any m amount of different things. <laughs> cats are just basically bred, and that's it. So they you know, they create their own society. Yeah, but I had heard that that they just think we're big cats. Well, I read that I read that same article, and that's that's the reason, or at least the article was trying to say the research is showing is that's the reason that they'll. They'll uh, lick your forehead because they want you to pet theirs back, and they'll they'll paw at your face, and you know, like they do with other cats. I'm still wanting to know how many cats you have. <laughs> Not Is telling. it more than ten? Not telling. I will tell you that at one point, because I had t two females who had litters, that I had eleven cats at one time. Is it more than that? I'm not telling. See, uh, now, I had a friend. I had two friends. <laughs> it who, may be, it who, may not who be. Who could not, if they saw a cat starving somewhere, could not let them sit by the side of the road. And they wound up having something like 30 or 40 cats yeah. in their apartment. And they moved uh, into the living room and let the cats have the bedroom. That's a little rough. There, I, 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 I can't tell you what that, that, what that house smelled like. I do know a few uh, rural farmers who have taken in i don't know if quite that many yeah maybe a dozen or so at a time and and raised them all outside people who's you know the wife or whatever was particularly partial to cats or whatnot but we've just ended up with a bunch i mean it, it's a funny mm -hmm. story the cat that loves the water uh we went to a movie rental place down the street uh one night and the lady that was in there had a couple that she had found in the back alley. And I always tell everyone, it's like, yeah, we went to rent a movie and we came home with a cat. Isn't it amazing you know? how we started out with World War II and wound up talking about cats? Uh, Patrick, you've been very quiet for the last hour or so, so I thought I'd drag you kicking and screaming into this conversation. Okay, I, well, I don't like cats, so... Yeah, but do, do, have, you, have you had pets? Uh, yeah, dog. Yeah? And I like dog specifically... Because they do what I tell them to. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's it. And that's the bottom now, line. Now, I mean, can you believe it? The reason I like cats is for exactly the opposite reason. I like cats because I can't tell them what to do. Because they are so independent that when when they when they say they act like they love me, I know it's voluntary. It's not, oh, you're right. my master, right. and I'm going to hug you and <laughs> kiss you, and I'm going to tell you how wonderful you are. Oh, yes, you beat me, but I love you anyway. That's a dog. Yeah, but you yeah. know what? A cat goes, you just fed me, fuck you. You know what? <laughs> what? If I don't feed your ass, you're not going to fucking eat. <laughs> so you still need me. No, cats realize that. You're around but, for two reasons. But, but, to, because they can't operate a can opener. That's one reason. <laughs> and the other reason you're around is because they can't change the litter. Outside of that, they have no need for you. And I have yeah. zero need for them. Yeah, but that's why I like cats. Yeah, it, I agree. It, I huh? <laughs> it, it, you, you, Rob, you're saying you I, agree? I, I'm completely in agreement with you. I've had both, and I never thought I would be a cat person until I got a cat. And then I, you know, I was like, wow, you know, these are really cool animals. And you begin to see... And understand the workings of a cat. And, you know, when I tell my cat to come to me, mm -hmm. sometimes she does. Other times, it's like she, I go, you know, I'll go, come here, Maxie. And she'll start to, and then she'll go, hold on a second. I'm a cat. I'll come when I want to come. You know, you yeah. can see she starts to move, and then she thinks better of it. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, other times she'll come right up on me. 
Oh, or, you know? or here's the thing cats love to do. When they know there's somebody in the house, like you invite a friend over and they hate cats, they that's the first lap they jump up on. <laughs> uh, yes, Patrick. That's exactly what happened to me. I had a, my best friend, uh, one of his cats, they had four cats in the house, and this one particular cat I was allergic to. Yeah. And that particular cat always, no matter where I was sitting in their house, would jump up on whatever chair I was on and sit behind me. Because mm-hmm. uh, there was just a, maybe three, four inches between the back of the chair and me, depending on how I was sitting. Mm-hmm. That's where she'd sit. And I learned to like that cat, but anytime I left their house, I'd have to wash my hands and my face mm-hmm. and go home and shower <laughs> because for whatever reason, I was allergic just to that cat. But the other cat didn't bother me, but, mm-hmm. and that's the particular cat that loved the hell out of me. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, they will always go with the person that doesn't uh, particularly yeah. like them. They, they can they can grow a particular attachment to humans though I think I mean like I said we've had several that we raised from literally the, uh, they were abandoned I mean that we had to bottle feed their eyes were barely even open and they'll they've grown attached I mean my wife had a cat oh yeah she she she, got, she just well, died well, recently she well, got the, sick that was just completely attached well to the her. reason why I've always loved and liked the uh, Siamese is because of all the cats that I've uh, I've known. Uh, they are the most kind, they are the most affectionate and most uh, get most attached to people. I think that's maybe what you feel about your cat, Rob. Exactly, because it's got some of that Siamese trait in it. And uh, they, they, the Siamese cat is an amazing animal, just an amazing animal. Listen, I'm going to let Jim go because uh, I know you've got a show to do in about uh, about three mi- two minutes from right now. So I'll. Yep. Well, Boy, you better get, in that truck get the fuck out of you here. You better get in that truck and get down to the Log Broadcast Center, damn it. That's right. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, I always have to do that because I think he sometimes will forget, and then, you know, the next thing you know, he's got to be on the air. By the Where's way, Tony by, the, by the way, Rob, since you have to listen to all this stuff, and over the weekend you've got to put together our, our GabNet Rewinds, which we really appreciate because you do such a great job. And next week you're going to be substituting for Albert, which is another thing you're going to be doing. Yeah. Uh, first time ever doing a talk show. Right. It'll be, I think you can do great. Um, but uh, all I wanted to say was that uh, people should probably listen to the Revelstoke Jim episode where he makes something out of wood. Right. The, the payoff on that is one of the best payoffs ever. Uh, it's just amazing, just amazing stuff. Hey, listen, I think you know something. It's time for me to. Uh, where's that theme I usually play? There it is. Here, here, there. There we go. You been, yeah, it's been great. We've had a nice time. We started out talking about VE Day, and we wound up with cats. And I didn't know Josh <laughs> had eighty cats in his house, but I guess we do now. A few less than that. A few less than that. Well, you just like pussy. That's it. <laughs> And speaking of liking pussy, there's Patrick, the old uh, <laughs> pussy hound himself. And uh, uh, Rob, thank you so much for, for not only this, but everything else you do for us. Mark, I hope you get to feel better, Mark. Uh, leg. Ugh. Uh, Oy vey, Just okay. cut it off if it hurts. Yeah, just cut I it know. off. <laughs> yeah, he, he, <laughs> listen, he's an expert. Uh yeah. Uh, Phil Meyer, thank you for your contribution. And Sam, glad you joined us. I hope you'll do it again really soon. Now that you know how to do it, please. We'd love to see you again. And Alex, I'm not going to be around until next Friday. Okay. Uh, but uh, so if you don't see me for a week, I didn't get hit by a car. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> York. And we'll see you yeah. again. Bye bye. I'm Alex Bennett. That's it for this morning or after evening, excuse me, or whenever you're listening. You see her, as always. Tell her I love her, okay? Okay.